But 1 Peter chapter 2, let me read for you verse 4 and 5 from the ESV. Hear the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious... You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be to be holy, uh, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord God, we do thank you for your word. And now as we Hear these words, these inspired words from your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds today. That you would draw us to your Son. That we would be obedient to the gospel call. And saturate ourselves with this message from your word this morning. I confess to you, Lord, that this is a message that I at some level, am incapable of preaching. I can mouth the words and make the sounds, but you must, as always, speak to the hearts of the people today. And that is my prayer that you would do for their good and for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Several years ago, I was in Boston... Uh, this was a long time ago. I was in Boston for the Society of Biblical Literature meeting and the Evangelical Theological Society, which is a, a conference for Bible scholars. Uh, a friend of mine and I were there, a friend of mine from the seminary. This was when I was working my Ph.D. at New Orleans Seminary. And we were in Boston, and, and my friend was actually from Boston. Uh, and Well, actually, he was from Ethiopia, but he had lived in Boston for several years, planted a church there and everything before coming to New Orleans. And and so since we were in Boston, in uh, the time that we had not at the conference, uh, he wanted to show me around town a little bit. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time, that, because most of the time we was at the conference, but uh, we, went, we were able to go to a couple of restaurants and some, some other things. We went to a couple of Ethiopian restaurants, great Ethiopian restaurants. If you've never had Ethiopian food, it's very good. And so we did that. We went to, I remember one Asian restaurant uh, that we went to. Uh, Warren, he knew the owner of the restaurant, and so they didn't bring us a menu. You, the owner would just kept bringing us out things. Taste this and try this and taste this. I remember, I remember he brought a fish out. Uh, I mean, this huge fish on this platter. I don't know how they did it. They somehow encrusted it with uh, salt or something, and it looked like a statue. I mean, it looked like a like a little statue. It was like sitting up, had its head on it, tail on it, the whole thing, and sitting in the middle of the, of the table, and you just ate off of it like that. It was crazy. Uh, it was good, but it was crazy. But uh, anyway, out of all those few things, there was one thing that. We wanted, he wanted to go and do. And so uh, one day we took a little time. Like I said, we didn't have a lot of time, but we took the tea, which in Boston, the tea is, is like the subway, but it's, some of it's underground, some of it's above ground, they call it the tea. And so we took the tea over, and it was kind of misty that day a little bit, but we got out, and we walked a few blocks, and we walked in these big gates uh, onto the campus uh, there, and he wanted to show me around, and we kind of walked around showing I me mean, this historic campus. We were, tried to go in a couple of the buildings, but uh, you had to have a student ID to get in most of the buildings, and classes were going on. And so you couldn't disrupt classes. But we did kind of walk around a little bit. And like I said, we didn't have a lot of time. It was kind of rainy and everything. And so we went to leave and we walked out of the, the big iron gates that they have there. Uh, my friend Ascello turned to me and he said, So Don, now you can say with honesty, you went to Harvard. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and, 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 and that, that joke that I tell you, is that there's a reason why I say that. That joke would not work in Greek. It works in English because in English, you know, there's sort of a, a word play there. Usually when you say you went to and you say a school, it means you went there continually. You enrolled in class.
passes and all the rest. Um, but you, but, but, uh, but, but use the word we went, just like say you went to the store yesterday. That doesn't mean that you kept going to the store ongoing. But we in English use the same word. In Greek, it's a little different. You would actually, so that joke wouldn't even work in Greek because the words would be different words, or at least spelled very differently. The reason I mention that is because of the text of Scripture that we have before us this morning. I want to emphasize something that Peter is saying here that you might miss when he says, as you come to him. This is just three words in the Greek. It's five words in English, but three words in Greek. And as I was starting to look at this next section of the uh, epistle uh, from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2 here, verse 4 through, say verse 8 to 10 or so, is the next section. This week when I was preparing, I really couldn't get past those first three words. As Peter simply says, as you come to Christ. That word, those English words, as you come, is one word in the Greek, and I know this is more than you want to know, but it is a present uh, participle there that implies an action with continuing results. And there's some theological application there that I don't want you to miss. Is when a man comes to Christ, he continues to come to Christ. And so Peter is writing here to a group of believers. And he, as we've said over and over already in chapter 1, there are certain things that are just indicative, certain things that are just true about believers. And it's the elect. You come to Christ and continue to come to Christ. I was just gripped with that thought this week, and so I want to sort of just pause and reflect on this thought about coming to Christ. And what does it mean to come to Christ? A very simple message, but in many ways may be the most important message you'll ever hear. And this message goes out to everyone in this room, whether you have been a believer for years and years, or if you're still holding out and have not yet come to Christ. Maybe you've come to church, maybe you've come to religion, but you haven't yet come to Christ. And so I want to look at this thought under a few different heads, really thinking about these three words, coming to Him. And of course, Him being a pronoun referring to the Lord, taste and see that the Lord is good, the person of Jesus Christ. And so if you're taking notes, the first thing that I want you to see is this coming is personal. It's a personal coming. It's a personal coming. And when I say a personal coming, what I mean by that is you're come, you must come to the person of Christ. I'm not necessarily talking about that you personally need to come, even though that is a real point, an important point, maybe I should elaborate on that just briefly, that you must come to Christ. It's not enough for you that your mother came to Christ. It's not enough for you that your father came to Christ. It's not enough for you that, uh, that a sibling has come to Christ, or a child has come to Christ, or your cousin came to Christ, or a guy that you know one time came to Christ. No, you must come to Christ. But my real emphasis here on being personal is to point out that we must come to the person of Christ. See, the gospel call is not a call to a religion. It's not just a call to a philosophy. It's not just a call to an idea. It is not just a call to a set of principles. It's not even a call to a set of doctrines and belief, even though all of those things are associated with it. When we break through all of those things, it is a coming to Christ, to the person of Christ. It is not even just coming to, oh, let me elaborate on a couple of those things. It's not coming to religion. It's not coming to religion. It's not coming to, uh, you know, a, a, a change of li lifestyle. While that is important, and many things are important and associated with this, you must come to Christ. Would you, I, I, I'll put it this way. It's not even just coming to 
I I want you to listen to this closely because I don't want to be misquoted here, and I'll speak carefully. It's not just coming to the Scriptures. It's coming to Christ. Now, of course, you're hearing that being said by your pastor who you know has a reputation for holding the Scriptures very high. We have a very high view of Scripture. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God. We believe it is inerrant. We believe it is authoritative. We believe it is trustworthy. We believe it is sufficient. However, we must not forget that the Bible is here to point us to Christ. You see, it's not a call just to the Scriptures. Because I, just a moment ago, I mentioned going to, or going to the Society of Biblical Literature, which I remember doing that several occasions, and sort of having a, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, uh, you know, sort of grappling with this idea that there were men and women at the Society of Biblical Literature who had dedicated their life to studying the Scriptures on an academic level and had completely missed Christ. They were studying it like they would study any other book. They would study the Scriptures like they would study Shakespeare. They would study the Scriptures like they would study ancient Egypt. They would get into the grammar and the syntax and the linguistics of it all and trace it back into all these ancient Semitic languages. And these were some of the smartest people in the world, yet they would focus on Scripture and completely miss Christ. As a preacher of the Bible that holds the Scripture high, it was a wake-up call to me to make sure that in all of our focus of Scripture, we remember where the Scripture points. The end of the study of the Scripture is not an intellectual exercise. It is not just to make us smarter. It is to make us, or it is to point us to the person of Christ. You see, this is a personal call. We can't study the Scriptures and miss Christ. Now, of course, with that said, let me make sure that you don't misunderstand that and hear at any level us belittling the Scriptures because it is the Scriptures that point us to Christ. Without the Scriptures, we just have a Christ of our own imagination, a plastic Jesus, a little bobblehead Jesus that you can put on your, on your car uh, dashboard is the Jesus of our own imagination, our own making. I was reminded just yesterday, I was talking to a friend of mine who has a, a several boxes of books that he wants to donate to me. He said some of them are better than others, and he was looking through them. We were talking on the phone, and he was pulling them out, and he said one of them was the classic book, In His Steps. Are you familiar, are, are some of y'all familiar with the book, In His Steps? I remember reading that book as a teenager and, and really being impacted by it and then later reading it again and realizing there's some real deficiencies in the book in spite of the fact that it was helpful in certain ways. If you're not familiar with the book, you might be familiar with one of the little phrases that came out of the book in his steps, what would Jesus do? There was a fad, I guess it was, when was that, in the 80s or 90s or so, little what would Jesus do bracelets. The problem with that question, it's actually not, not really a bad question. The problem is that many took that question, what would Jesus do, and answered that question, not according to the Scriptures, but according to their own imaginations. I can't tell you how many uh, times I had a conversation with someone, and they would, uh, when we're arguing, <laughs> we're arguing about something, and they would say, I just can't imagine Jesus would, and just fill in the blank. I said, well, that's the problem. We're not left to our own imaginations what Jesus would and wouldn't do. We have the Scriptures that tell us what Jesus did and didn't do. But as we study the Scriptures, we must find in them Christ. We find in them Christ. And so that's why I say that this is a personal coming to Christ, coming to the person of Christ. And so when we open the pages of Scripture and read about the baby that was born in a manger, we recognize that it was an actual, literal human being, God in the flesh, that lived a sinless life. 
He taught. He called people to himself. He fed the 5,000. And he called people not to come for the bread, not to come for the fish, but come to me, he said. And so when Peter echoes this coming and alludes to this coming. He is talking about a personal coming to Christ. The second thing that I want you to see in uh, this text and these just simple words here of this coming to Christ it is not only a, a personal coming, it is a spiritual coming. It is a spiritual coming to Christ, not a physical coming to Christ. In the passage that Mr. Larry just read a little while ago, Jesus was grappling with this with and knocking heads with the Pharisees, explaining to them the difference between coming to him physically and coming to him spiritually. See, they were coming to him physically because they liked the things that he provided for them. Today, we cannot come to Jesus physically in the flesh. But many people come to, and I'm going to put Jesus in scare quotes there, come to Jesus, come to religion, come to church because they like the physical things or the, the, the accoutrements that come with feeling religious. They like feeling good about themselves because they've done a spiritual sounding thing. They like the reputation that they might get from others. Those kinds of benefits in our society today are waning, of course. The people come to religion for many things. We need to be careful that we're not coming to Jesus because of the accoutrements the extras, the blessings, the, the uh, outside things that we come to Christ, not for the physical things, not for the networking, not for the f feelings that we might get, not for the, the, the satisfaction that we might gain, temporal satisfaction that we might gain, but we come to Christ spiritually. We come to Him spiritually, not for the bread, not for the fish, but for Christ. And so it is a spiritual coming. It is a coming by faith. It is a coming by faith. It is a coming by repentance, which are spiritual, spiritual things, faith and repentance. Well, let, let, me, let me jump to this, and I'll, I'll just be, be blunt. It is not a physical coming to the front of the room. Not a physical coming to the front of the room even. And, or a physical coming to church. Now, y'all know that I'm a fan of coming to church. I like coming to church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share uh, coming, to, coming to church. That's what we ought to be doing. And 10,000 sermons can be talked about of God is calling us as believers to gather together on the Lord's day to worship Him in spirit and in truth. But coming to the building is not the coming that Peter is talking about here. It is coming to Christ. Or as I was about to just say, coming to the, the front of the room. Many of us were raised in traditions where that was part of a Sunday morning church service. That the close of the service, at the end of the sermon, there would be a time where there was what some people would call an altar call, where you had to walk forward down the, the aisle and I walk the aisle and make a public profession for, for Christ. And oftentimes, that physical coming was replacing the spiritual coming. And people got confused in their minds. I've gone round and round with individuals talking and wanting to hold on to those tradition, that tradition of walking down the aisle. And when we said that that is a new tradition that is only about 100 years old or so, that in the historic Christian faith, there was no such thing as walking down an aisle in the church service. And there's no place in the Bible that says that we need to come to the front of a room. They would immediately turn to scriptures that says, Jesus says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. And I'm like, hold on, time out, slow down, cowboy. Where does it say that Jesus is standing at the front of a church building? 
He is not calling us to change our physical location. He is calling us to change our spiritual condition and bow before Christ as king. It is coming to Christ, not to the front of the room. You see, that switcheroo is very dangerous. It might seem like it's something small, but it's extremely dangerous. At the risk of sounding nitpicky, I will say that we as Baptists especially, or we as Protestants even more generally, will criticize, and rightly so, the doctrine of transubstantiation that Roman Catholicism has. You know what the doctrine of transubstantiation is? It's the doctrine in the Lord's Supper that they believe that the, the juice and the bread literally become the body and blood of Christ. That's what they believe. They believe that taking the juice, the, the wine, and the bread is, the, is physically taking in Jesus Christ. And so they have exchanged, transubstantiation, they have exchanged the physical reality of Christ with the, or the, excuse me, the spiritual reality of Christ with the physicality of bread and wine. Yet many Baptists do the exact same thing when we exchange the spiritual reality of Christ with the physicality of the front of a room. That coming to the front of the room means coming to Christ. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Can you meet Christ in the front of the room? Absolutely. Can you meet Christ in the pew where you sit? Absolutely. Can you meet Christ kneeling beside a bunk bed as an eight-year-old boy? Yes, absolutely. It is a spiritual coming, not a physical one. While we're on the subject, I might as well go ahead and say that I know that years ago, here at Lakeshore Baptist Church, we follow that tradition. And I hope I don't sound overly negative against that tradition. God has used that in the last hundred years or so in, in very good ways. However, I believe that many times it is misused and misunderstood. I remember one time in particular years ago, and we've not done that tradition in uh, many, many years, a uh, decade and a half at least. But I remember when for years I was preaching that the aisle doesn't, walking does not save you. Yet when I went to baptize someone, there was someone else in the community that was very worried about the person who was getting baptized. They were worried that the person actually was not really saved. And I wanted to talk to them because, you know, if you think that someone's not a believer, you know, what is it about this person's life? Is there no fruit in keeping with repentance? Is there something that I need to know about as their pastor? And so we sat down and we talked about it, and their answer was, I never saw them walk the aisle. I never saw them walk the aisle. And so they assumed that even though that person was professing faith in Jesus Christ, they weren't really saved because they didn't walk the aisle. Of course, I had to explain that's not how it works. And apparently, the fact that we were still walking the aisle was misleading people. And I said, let's just stop doing that. As for me, I'm not going to call people to the front of the room anymore. Not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but it's sending a mixed message, sending a confusing message. I don't want to get anything in the way. I want to call sinners to Christ, not to just a physical bodily change of location. And so it is a spiritual coming. This spiritual coming involves, like I said a moment ago, faith and repentance. Faith and repentance, a trusting in God, a turning of directions to believing what Christ has done on the cross for you. As we boldly proclaim the good news of the gospel, we say that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. In Christ alone, we must come spiritually to Christ. And so number one, I want you to see that this is a personal coming. Number two, I want you to see that it is a spiritual coming. And number three, I want you to see that it is a continual coming. It's a continual coming. 
That was my uh, point with the opening illustration. The verbiage that Peter uses here is not just a one-time punctiliar thing that happened once in history. Hey, I came to Christ one day back in the 1970s. No, someone who comes to Christ continues to come to Christ. It is a daily habit of repentance and faith. You see, we talk about how a person is saved, how a person is converted, how a person comes to Christ. When they realize that they are sinners, when they realize that Jesus is not a sinner, that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for sin, and they turn from their sin in repentance and faith and turn to Christ, that is how we, we are, through that repentance and faith, we are justified before God. But it's also how we continue to be sanctified for the rest of our lives. As we turn from our sin, it is not a one-time turning. It is a continual turning. As we place our faith in Jesus Christ, it's not a one-time placement. It is a continual placement. It is putting our faith in Jesus Christ day by day. It is a continual coming to Christ. In faith in worship, in prayer, we continue to come to Christ. Now with that initial coming, with speaking of that initial coming, oftentimes there are obstacles that are in the way or excuses that people make why they cannot come to Christ. So many different excuses, and this is not in the text of our Scripture particularly, but just from anecdotal experience, I know that many people will make excuses on why they can't come to Christ. I would urge you this morning, if you are still making those excuses, put those excuses away and come to Christ. Some of those excuses are things like questions that you still have in your mind. Maybe mysteries that are in the Scriptures that you don't really understand. And many people, whether they, whether they might say it or just think it in their mind, say, I would come to Christ, except for I have all these unanswered questions. They might have questions about the second coming. They might have questions about the virgin birth. They might have questions about where dinosaurs came from or whether or not Adam and Eve had a belly button or how many angels can dance on the head of a pen or maybe some serious questions on exactly how the doctrine of election works or all these other things. Let me, explain, let me urge you not to allow those mysteries or those questions to keep you from Christ. Come to Christ. One day, your questions will all be answered when you see Him face to face, but you must first come to Christ. I love the discipline of apologetics. Apologetics is basically answering those questions that people have about the faith. However, there's one pitfall that certain types of apologetics fall into and that is allowing the unsaved person to deviate away from Christ. And so somebody says, is, you're trying to evangelize someone, you're trying to tell them about Christ, you're trying to confront them with their sin, you're trying to point them to the only way of salvation and they want to talk about where dinosaurs came from. If you are in those shoes, let me just say it as bluntly as I possibly can. And I'm not even trying, I'm not trying to be funny at all. But don't go to hell for the sake of a dinosaur. As I said, Jesus will answer all of those questions when you see him face to face, but you must first come to Christ. So don't allow that to be an obstacle. Another obstacle is other Christians. Other Christians. I think it was, was it last week or week before that we talked a little bit about hypocrites in the church? Of course, not in our church, but other churches. 
I've often had people say, I would attend church, I would come to Christ, but there's too many hypocrites in the church. And of course, my answer has always been, there's not too many. We've got plenty of room for one more. But don't... Let me say it this way. We're not calling you, God is not calling you to come to a Christian. He's calling you to come to Christ. Human beings are sinners. He's not calling you to come to a pastor. Let me tell you, Brother Don is a sinner. Brother Don will let you down. Brother Don will disappoint you. Brother Don is a fallible human being. Do not come to Brother Don. Come to Christ. God, pity my soul if my human weakness gets in the way of someone coming to Christ. I am not your priest. I cannot save you. Only Christ saves. And so don't allow the weaknesses of human beings to get in the way of you coming to Christ. Other obstacles that come before people is some, and, they, and this is probably one that people would not admit. However, oftentimes I believe that the cares of this world keep people from Christ. I've had a few discussions with individuals who were brave enough and honest enough to say, if I came to Christ, I'd have to stop some of the things that I'm doing. And I'm not willing to do that. Most people wouldn't say that out loud. You tuck it away in a place in your mind, in your heart, that God sees. You're wanting to hold on to your sin and you weigh the balance and you say, my sin is over here, Christ is over here, I like my sin better. Let me say boldly to you this morning, if that is you, all of those roads lead to hell. They're dead ends. All the pleasures of this world end in broken cisterns that can hold no water. I would urge you to turn to Christ, the living water, where there's pleasures forevermore. Turn to Christ. Don't allow the pleasures of sin for a season to keep you from Christ. Turn to Christ. One more obstacle. We'll begin to close this discussion this morning. It's procrastination. Waiting. Many people will say, I'll come to Christ eventually. I'll come to Christ one day. Maybe they have some other things they want to do first. Because they know Jesus is going to call them to change their lifestyle. Jesus might call them to change their priorities. And they like their lifestyle and they like their priorities. I want to put, off, put it off as long as possible. I know I'm going to sound like an old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone fundamentalist preacher, Greg, but it's true. We are not promised tomorrow. We are not. The pastor's family that we have been praying for for the last few weeks, Pastor Quentin over in Picayune or Poplarville, when he woke up that morning... His kids did not know that that was the last time they would see their dad drive away. The night before, his wife did not know that was the last time her husband was going to climb into the bed with her. In a split second, a vehicle out of control on I-10 ended his life like that. I know we don't like to think about that. 
We like to think that we have a long time ahead. We like to think that, that when it is our time, we're going to have some, some, some time that we can get things right with God before we meet Him face to face. We are not promised that. And so let me say with all the clarity that I can, come to Christ today. Come to Christ. Come to the person of Christ. It's a personal coming. It is a spiritual coming in faith and repentance. It is a continual coming of a lifestyle of coming. And so insert that sermon there for those of you who have come to Christ. Continue to come to Christ. If you have not yet come to Christ, push away all of those obstacles. Push down the barriers and enter into the gates. Come to Christ. One final word, and this is for believers. Notice Peter says, coming to Christ. Notice he does not say, go to Christ. He says, come to Christ. Do you recognize the implication there? Peter's not telling you to do something that he is not already doing himself. Peter has come to Christ. Peter is continuing to come to Christ. He recognizes the benefits that are found in Christ. The grace, the mercy, the love, the strength, the acceptance, the forgiveness, and all the rest. He is not telling someone else to do something that he has not done himself. What is the implication for us as believers today? Let us call people to Christ. Let us call others to Christ. Let us not be satisfied with just coming to Christ on our own, but to come to Christ. Verse 3, right before this, verse 4, Peter says, If you have tasted that the Lord is good. You ever notice when you taste something good, you want to share it with somebody else? You want to tell somebody else about it. Man, have you seen, have you been to that restaurant over there, that new place? Have you tried this on the menu? Have you done this? I mean, just earlier, I, I couldn't help but tell an illustration that had nothing at all to do with the sermon. But that big old fish on the table that, at that Asian restaurant in Boston tw nearly 20 years ago was something else. You had to share it. You have to share it. And so if you have come to Christ, let me encourage you to call others to Christ and make sure that we are as clear as clear can be this is a personal call this is a spiritual call it is an etern eternal continuing call a personal coming a spiritual coming a continual coming to Christ let's pray dear Lord I do thank you and praise you Lord for your word Lord, I pray that we may come to Christ today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.